This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show. Hey guys, it's the Indie Mayhem Show. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studios in Pittsburgh, PA. And this is the show where we talk with people in and around independent professional wrestling, having a lot of great stories, learning a lot about uh, people old and new in the business. And uh, we're going to get into a lot of history today, I believe, in Pittsburgh wrestling. <laughs> so, uh, of course, please check out everything at WrestlingMayhemShow.com, IndieWrestling.us. You can find out past episodes of this, other great wrestling podcasts, as well as uh, a lot of the people that we talk to uh, on the show are featured over uh, on a lot of those shows and on uh, the shows over at IndieWrestling.us and IndieWrestling.network, uh, including our guest today. Uh, you can drop us a line at goodtimes at WrestlingMayhemShow.com or 412-206-WMS0. If you have any questions for any upcoming guests that we do have announced over on our Facebook pages, uh, or if you have any suggestions on who we should talk to in the future, again, we can't watch all the independent professional wrestling. It's, it's, it's hard to watch all of WWE at this point. Uh, but if there's anybody you think we're missing out on that we need to have a conversation with, let us know on any of those platforms. So uh, my guest today, I, I'm really excited, and I've been trying to get on here for a couple months now. And of course, scheduling has been really crazy. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, I've always heard about this tag team called The Wrong Crowd. And I may have seen the wrong crowd. I know I've seen the wrong crowd at least once at a benefit show at the Ross River Ice Gardens. And uh, I was like, well, who are these guys? Uh, myself only watching independent pro professional wrestling uh, since 2006. Uh, I've only watched uh, a, a couple of groups. And then I, I uh, uh, probably about a year ago, I think I found myself in the wrong crowds because I found myself working with one Paul Atlas that's joining me here today. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Paul? <laughs> Pretty good. How's it going, sir? Good, good. So, uh, like I said, this is this is exciting for me because you know I, I don't know much about your history. You know, uh, I'm like, you know, hey, who is this? I don't know who Paul Atlas is on commentary when we first started working together, right? <laughs> yeah. And then the more I learned from you was actually your conversations with Jim LaMotta as you're, you know, providing color uh, for these matches and everything. And you, you do touch on your history here and there on that. And that's actually only the history from uh, the, the 2000s. It was all the way back to the to the late 90s. And yes, I am that old. <laughs> yeah, as I've been discovering, we'll talk about a little bit here. But, you know, I, we, we, you know I've been digging a little bit of the archives here. And also, if, uh, if you guys are on a video with us uh, over here, I do have... A little bit. I've been digging up here with the PWX TV from. I think this was this is marked as. Uh, let's see. Does it say 1998? Mm -hmm. I believe uh, this is this. You're on the right in this image. This might be your. This might be your image for the podcast uh, when I post this later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Given an interview, and uh, there's some kind of a, a, a six man tag action mm -hmm. against Webb. Yes, which, that was uh, Tarantula, Devious, and uh, the Mauler. Yeah. And, you know, T, T, T Ranchel is another one that I've only seen recent years at KSWA. <laughs> so, and, but always, like, you and, and, and T Ranchel are always names that I've heard, mm -hmm. like, from the Shirley Does and everybody else, like, you know, the Jesse the Marks guys I've known in the Pittsburgh area, too. So, well, let's roll it back a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, always throw some icebreakers out there for people who maybe don't know you. Um, so... What was your earliest memory of professional wrestling? My earliest memories of professional wrestling, um, well, I was the son of an Italian immigrant. Mm. So that meant studio wrestling in the 70s. You know, Bruno San Martino, Dominic Danucci, Bill Cardell, that whole space. And every Saturday, you know, when I was down at my grandparents' house, uh, you know, it would be on and we would be watching and he would take me to the live matches, you know, and, and I mean, he was a steel worker. So it was very blue collar, very. And, and I just I kind of fell in love with the whole thing of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then as I grew older, I wanted to find a way to get into it. And you know, a lot of people will talk about um, the love for wrestling, which I have and I always have had. But it's also an addiction. 
You know, uh, uh, there's that, uh, that old adage that it's, it's kind of like the mob. Once you're in, you never get out. <laughs> so that's kind of where I fell into, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I watched all the, uh, you know, all the WWE, F, whatever products at the time. Mm-hmm. And then in the late 80s, with the uh, advent of cable television, of course, uh, we were able to catch in syndication the NWA shows. And as much as I loved the WWE product at the time growing up, as I got a little older, you kind of fell in love with the NWA product because it seemed so much more real. I mean, the char- the people were like, they were people. It was like, yeah. this is really happening. It seemed more competitive versus like the WWF was probably leaning towards the cartoonish. Correct. At that yeah. Point. Yeah. At that time mm-hmm. when, when, you know, when cable came about and NWA started coming up north, mm-hmm. you know, so to speak with the, with the TBS programs and they even had the, the syndicated programs that they showed, uh, you know, the worldwide wrestling and things like that. But yeah, mm-hmm. it just seemed so much more real. You could get more invested in the product cause it was like, wow, that's really happening. Mm-hmm. You know, um, then in about 1990, uh, of course, you always had the after mags because we didn't have the internet back then. And that's the Bill After magazines, like the because I, I had this with Shirley Doe because he always mentioned them on the one show we did, and I was like, I was like, what's an after mag? I'm like, oh, Bill After. <laughs> yes. So that's like yes. your Pro Wrestling Illustrators and, yes. and things like that. That was yeah. our internet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, you yeah. had to go and get the magazines and yeah, you look black and white newsprint. Yes, and, yeah. man. occasional color photography, you know, yeah, color yeah. photographs, nice, nice yeah. color spread in the middle. And sometimes. so, so I knew some of the NWA names. Yeah, you know, even though I mean back then nobody crossed over and mentioned. You know, when an NWA guy would come to WWF, you never, they never would get into his history. Who's this hot rookie? Yes, he just who's, came out who, of nowhere. Who's this hot rookie Harley race? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There was never any mention of their history because that's the way it was done back then. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the people up north knew northern wrestling. The people down south knew southern wrestling. You know, so you knew them from the magazines and then they would come in. And one particular magazine, it had this ad in it for people looking f- to find people who wanted to become professional wrestlers. Okay, I do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So I gave the number a call. He gave me an address. You, know, you had to go get it on a map back then. No GPS, <laughs> no whatever. So when I drove to the area, it was in an extremely horrible part of town. And I looked around and I said, mm, nah, this probably isn't a good idea. And I mm-hmm. left. Mm-hmm. So, And apparently someone else who had um, seen the same thing, seen mm-hmm. the same article, must have did the same thing, but I guess he made contact with this person and said, look, you're not who you say you are. Um, I am um, looking for people. I, I want your numbers. I, I don't know if he threatened his life or whatever he did. <laughs> so I get a phone call and, you know, the guy says, hey, I hear you answered this ad. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. If you're him, I really don't think. He says, no, no, I'm not him. He said, I want you, uh, if you're still interested, I want you to meet me, you know, at this shopping center and I will take you to a legitimate professional wrestling school. Mm-hmm. So uh, at that point, I'm kind of like, eh, but my love to get into the business kind of overshadowed my common sense at that point. And I said, yeah. sure, why not? <laughs> you know, again, no which, internet, which no is, nothing. Which is the usual formula for people that get into pro wrestling. Exactly. Probably. So, you know, it's like, okay, I don't know anything about this guy. You know, there's, again, no internet. You can't look it up and go, oh, yeah, this guy's legit. It's like, okay, you know, I might be going to meet an axe murderer. I don't yeah. know, but I want to be a wrestler, damn it. <laughs> Speaking of which, I think an axe murderer just got in the chat room. So. Yeah. <laughs> So I met him and I followed him out uh, to this community center and we went into the community center and lo and behold, there's a wrestling ring. There Mm -hmm. are people training to be wrestlers. And that's where I met uh, Joe Perry and Sean Patrick, who were kind of like the people at the time around the Pittsburgh area. Mark Hildebrand, um, Mark Curtis, he was the WCW referee. He was involved with them. Uh, very so big in the 90s. Yes. If, if you watched uh, the Nitro era, the NWO, I, you know, a lot of people will remember or grew up on these days, um, that like he was very prominent in that. Mm-hmm. So. Yes, he was, he was a referee for them at that time, but he also started out as a wrestler. So, mm-hmm. you know, and him and Sean Patrick used to do these gimmicky matches, you know, the Orange Dynamo against the Ninja Turtle kind of things, <laughs> you know. And Sean Patrick, that's the current KSWA ref, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Sean has been around even longer than I have, and wow. Sean is. There's another guy I don't know his history. Oh, uh, he's the greatest. He's the greatest ref to work with in the world. Even even for an old guy like you know an older vet like me, it's like if you have a 
brain fart in the middle of the match, you just look over at Sean and he'll say, this looks like a really good time to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Uh, always a fun guy. I like seeing at the shows. Yes. Yeah. yeah he's yeah. put a lot of time and, and a lot of his life into the, into the business. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so we, I began training there. Um, Myself, uh, another guy at the time, his name was Scott Wilcox. He was from the area as well. He actually went and was doing some Memphis stuff mm -hmm. in the early 90s. Um, he actually took over the humongous role for a while down there in uh, USWA. Humongous? Yes, Lord Humongous. The, the Lord original, Humongous, okay. Yeah, the um, original Sid Vicious Role. Oh, okay. So they kind of, you know, because of the hockey mask, obviously, all you needed was a guy with muscles and <laughs> he could be him. So he kind of did that. And uh, so we began training and it was funny because it was July the 3rd, 1990. Went in there and, you know, they're like, okay, you want to be a wrestler? Let's show you a couple things. And they're like, hey, we've got uh, this little thing we're doing tomorrow um, at this uh, state representative's picnic. You want to be on it? Okay, so I began my training on the 3rd of July and wrestled my first match on the 4th of July. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it was... And, and, and by the way, like I know training today, like these kids are at least a year. <laughs> yeah, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there really is. Because um, that match was horrible, <laughs> believe yeah. me. I think I threw 30 clotheslines because that's really all I knew. They, they were just desperate for bodies at that point. They needed yeah. them, yes. Because at this time, you know, 1990... The territories had all just died. Yeah. You know, they were either run out of business or bought up between Vince and Crockett as far as he could go before he sold to Turner. There, you know, there was really no indie wrestling yeah. at that particular time. You know, these shows were almost, they were almost like the outlaw, the outlaw shows kind of became indie wrestling. Okay. Over the years. Okay. So, because like I said, there was there was no more territories. They, they just kind of filled the space as the territories disappeared and, yes. and fell through. Yes. Okay. So that's kind of the infancy of indie wrestling. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even really as popular then. You know, so, I mean, you may go three, six months in between doing anything. Mm -hmm. You know, and there wasn't places to train in between. You know, I mean, sometimes there were, sometimes there were. It just depended, you know. And I remember we were doing a, a show... I think it might have even been somewhere in this area, maybe I want to say um, Baldwin or something like that at the mm -hmm. gymnasium. And it was um, Dominic Danucci was on the show. Now we had, I had already been working for about a year. Mm -hmm. um, and Joe, of course, was involved. Sean was involved. Uh, Dr. Sam Siegel. Uh, he just recently passed away. The doc was, was tremendous, tremendous heel, tremendous heel manager, mm -hmm. uh, was on the show as well. And so was Dominic, Dominic Danucci. And he got a hold of Sam after watching the matches and he spoke of one of you know, my mat, one, my match in particular and a couple other guys. So Sam got a hold of Joe, Joe got a hold of me and said, Hey, Dominic is still running his school out in freedom PA. It was an old schoolhouse. And Dominic wants to know if you'd be interested in coming out. Shit, yeah. I'd be interested in coming out. You know, I mean, again, I was a son of an Italian or a grandson of an Italian immigrant. Dominic was the man mm -hmm. next to Bruno. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Okay, yeah, sure. You know, give me the address. I'll be there. And you know, I met with Dominic, you know, and we talked business. And I said, you know, he said, come on out, you know, you can come out. We, we train here every week, you know, and the ring was literally in a classroom. So there was no coming off the top rope. You hit the ropes, you hit the brick wall. So you learn to wrestle and you learn to polish your wrestling. And that's from there is where, you know, things got a little bit, you know, you still may have went three, six months in between mm -hmm. um, different things. But now the Indies were slowly starting. And that's actually where I met Tarantula. Uh, he was there at Dominic school mm -hmm. at that time. And, you know, just slowly progressed from there and kind of learned, learned the business end a little bit better, learned how to protect yourself in the ring in case you ran into any shady characters, which you never really find in wrestling. No, <laughs> no, no, not at all. You know, and, and I kind of became a more polished performer at that time, mm -hmm. you know, because this was just shortly after Shane had been there, Mick Foley had been there. Shane Douglas. Yes. Yes. yes Shane Douglas. And uh, we went from there and. Then, so this is this is the same school that we hear about if you if you read Mick Foley's book 
you know, c- coming to the Pittsburgh area, training yes. uh, mm-hmm. with, with Shane Douglas. Yep. Yeah, it was out in Freedom, Pennsylvania. Like I said, it was an old school house, mm-hmm. and he had the ring in a classroom. So, you know, you learn <clears throat> you learn more of the technical end with Dominic, obviously. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and of course, there was, it was a much different style back then anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, not a lot of what goes on today. And, and I have no trouble, no no problem whatsoever. With, you know, everything has to evolve. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I get this, you know, everybody, oh, they should go back to the old school ways. Eh, yeah, <laughs> no. You know what I mean? Everything has to evolve or it's going to die off eventually. Yeah, and there's a place for that, too, in an appreciation, yes. And I think that's the nice thing now is there are so many versions of professional wrestling, mm-hmm. right? Yes, there are. Um, Jake is uh, doing part of my interview for me here in the chat room. Uh, he says, Paul, what's an outlaw show for those that don't know? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's the old guy there. Huh? Um, outlaw shows used to be ones that came into a territory and tried to run shows. And, you know, I made the mob reference earlier and... That was literally, you know, they would go after them like a mob. They would, there would be a, you know, they would call out a hit on these people, so to speak. So they were kind of like, they were shows that, that just popped up out of nowhere. They had no, they didn't belong in the territory. There was no uh, state athletic commission licensing as much then, or? I'm not sure about that part of it, mm-hmm. but originally, you know, one thing that, that you never did is you never went into somebody else's territory. Right. Whether you were an established territory or you were an outlaw, mm-hmm. you're not supposed to cross over into someone else's territory. Everybody, you know, the line of demarcation was drawn in stone. And these are regions. Like, we, yes. we talk about, like, the Northeast region, the, mm-hmm. the Midwest, the Deep South, you know, things like that, right? Yes. And yeah. nobody nobody crossed over. Just like, you know, the old NWA territories. You know, nobody, the only person who would really cross between territorial lines was the NWA champion because he worked for the company, not for one particular promotion. Right. So that's when outlaw show was, it was just basically that it was a group of individuals just impeding on someone else's territory when they should not have been. Whereas today it's more, um, um, all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, look at the Pittsburgh yeah. area alone. You've yeah. got how many, look at South Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. How many companies that run the same basic, area that would never have happened that would never have flown back then yeah one would have taken over the territory and the rest would have been run out of town yeah yeah so um uh also i i think we need to mention t rancher he's been brought up a couple of times here um this, the t rancher is is a very large biker type of person uh-huh. <laughs> probably the biggest uh uh thing i can describe him as he and, and i know oh uh, the one no thing i has noted i think maybe jay garrett or somebody mentioned i believe t, t rancher can be seen during the ECW speech in Beyond the Mat, if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe like so. Like he's in the he's yeah. in that group there mm-hmm. uh, that night. So um, just a little background there. Uh, look him up; you'll find a lot of stuff. T. Dot mm. Rantula and uh, uh, T. He, T. Used to do a lot of different things with a lot of the different. You know, he did some things with WCW, WWF. Uh, I, I mean, I've done some myself, but he's probably done just a little. I never made it branched out into the WCW part of it. But he, he has a bit of a history, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, a good history as far as where he's been. Mm-hmm. So getting into it. So we're getting to, you know, what the early mid 90s. You're well into pro wrestling at this point. Um, we know that at least here in the Pittsburgh area, we, we start seeing more kind of wrestling TV pop up again. Uh, you know, that it's the advent of ECW probably around that area it's era too. How is, how is that, you know, Pittsburgh pro wrestling scene kind of changing as we're going through the nineties and you're, you're going along with it? Well, at, at the time, um, just before, uh, the birth of PWX, it was steel city wrestling, mm-hmm. Norm Connors. You know, and he ran the spot shows mainly and things of that nature. And then once you get up into about 1995, 96, that's when, uh, again, I got a call from Joe Perry. He said, hey, there's a, a, an upstart coming out, coming on. Um, you might want to check it out. Mm-hmm. You know, so, okay. Yeah, so he uh, gave me the address again. You know, we found the place. And that, that's where um, PWX had actually began, started to, to begin its journey at the Eastland Mall out in North for sales. Mm-hmm. You know, it was run um, out of a candy store, basically that Jim Miller had, it was his business, and Sean Evans, um, great guy, I miss Sean a lot every day, um, 
I guess basically came to Jim and said, Hey, I wanted to don't want to do this wrestling thing. And then mm-hmm. Jim was like, ah, I don't know about this, but he kind of fell for, you know, fell along with it. And they began running it at the first started running it outside of the candy store in the main part of the mall. Really? Um, yeah. Like, like in the corridor type yeah. of, of the mall and they began running their shows and they were running them there about every other week. So it was mm-hmm. like, yeah, this is a good thing. You know, mm-hmm. there's, there's work mm-hmm. to be had now. Mm-hmm. You know, and then eventually we moved into the store itself, into the back of the store. You know, was, was it like kind of like an old storeroom area? Um, and at that point, he had asked uh, myself and Brian Anthony because he originally he had a gentleman by the name of B.A. Briggs was doing his training. Uh, when B.A. left the area, he asked us if we wanted to take over the training. So, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, so we began to do the training. We were doing shows twice a month um and then eventually from there the the tv end of it started to come into effect Mm -hmm. you know and that's where now you began to get the exposure obviously because now you're you know you're doing your products on tv Mm -hmm. you know i mean and this is you know i i don't know if that's as big of a deal to get on television these days but i mean that was like i flip through my channels i find wwf i find wcw maybe ECW, and then you guys are right beside it, basically. Right, yeah. yeah. We were actually, I believe we were sandwiched in between Sunday Night Heat and ECW. Oh, wow. So <laughs> that was our, I mean, it was like, like you know, like one in the morning, but it yeah, was still, yeah. you were in that block there. So if you were watching Sunday Night Heat, or it was actually Shotgun Saturday Night, I'm sorry, because mm-hmm. it was on a Saturday. Uh, they, you know, they, they put on that show, and then, if you wanted CECW, we were right in between there. Yeah. So, you know, that, that gave a lot of good exposure to guys. Um, the, the clip that you had up of the wrong crowd with the, with the web, uh, that was actually on the television show. That was the broadcasters, you know, that was part of, of the TV at that time, you know, Mm -hmm. and a lot of guys got a lot of good exposure out of that. I mean, yeah, sure. It was just local, but it was funny because, um, we eventually PWX kind of had a unofficial official working relationship with WWE. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Jim had actually been to Titan Towers. I was there with him. Um, you know, they talk, he talked some stuff over with Cornette and we actually brought in at the time we joined the NWA, mm-hmm. which was going through WWE at that time. And this is what era is this? The still late 90s? This is 1998, 798. Okay. Yeah. okay. And we brought in Dan Severin, mm-hmm. um, who at the time was the NWA champ. And Dan and I actually worked the match for television, for, mm-hmm. P, you know, for PWX television. And I believe somebody mentioned the, uh, the clip of, um, there was a photo recently on, on social media of the outdoor show we did, King of the Ring. Yeah, this was, this was a, um, uh, Brandon Kay had reposted it. It was in, looked like it was in the parking lot of the Igloo, the Civic mm-hmm. Arena. Yes, it was. Uh, before the King of the Ring, the famous, infamous King of the Ring mm-hmm. that McFoley's uh, uh, Hell in a Cell match was. Yep. So. And, yeah, you know, then we, we subsequently, we went in because mm-hmm. they, they invited us to come in to watch the show as well. Um, and we ran into Dan and Dan he said, hey, yeah, come on down. We were down in catering, hanging out and stuff. And it was funny because he was saying he had mentioned that I, I believe the match with him and I had aired a few days prior to that event. Mm-hmm. And some of the boys were actually like, hey, we've seen you on this little local TV show. Uh, so they were even noticing it at the time. So it was kind of it was kind of kind of cool, kind of a big deal to be doing TV back yeah, then. Yeah. And you're right. It, I mean, that was a big deal because, mm-hmm. again, there was no live streaming you know, I pay per views, you know, nothing of that nature. So to be on TV at that time, even in something yeah. that small, that was the gateway. That was, that yeah. was it. Yeah. That opened up the doors for a lot of other, you know, opportunities and a lot of opportunity to be seen. So that was, that was really a big deal back then. And, you know, and, and we had the wrong crowd gimmick going on mm-hmm. and it was kind of funny because you do what you got to do to, to, stay as relevant as you can during your time and whatever. And Jim actually went back at one point uh, he went back and went through the shows and he says, you know, he come up to me, he says, you know who the person who was seen on our television show was the most. 
I said, no. He says, it was you. I was like, wow, that means people really wanted to, and I mean, I was one of the top heels, obviously. So it was like, to me, it was like, wow, people must really want to see me get my ass kicked. <laughs> because I must be that arrogant. And that's the goal, right? <laughs> exactly what it is. You know, Ooh. so to, to even hear something like that, you know, mm -hmm. that, that at that particular time you were that relevant in, in the business, mm -hmm. even it be on a small stage like that, it was, it was really a cool thing. Um, the, you know, obviously this connection with WWE, they, they've heard about this. It was, it was a lot different that, that there was, and maybe we're coming back to this. We're kind of seeing the NXT evolve, you know, kind of things and more acknowledgement of the Indies, uh, on that, on that platform. But, uh, it, it, you know, what, what 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 kind of opportunities did you, this kind of create for you? Did you did you get any dark matches with WWE yes, or anything? Yes, like that? Yes, it really it it did. I we did, I did a couple of matches down at the uh, at the igloo. Mm -hmm. um, we actually did a two night stint of Raw and SmackDown in Buffalo and Rochester, New York. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it opened it up. We did um, not just dark matches, but there was uh, 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 which WrestleMania was it? I think it was fifteen. Um, the Kane Triple H China thing, mm -hmm. and myself and Brian Anthony were actually the paramedics for the fireball gimmick that they did that night. You know, we ran to the so ring. So you were the... on WrestleMania. You had a WrestleMania. Well, moment. it wasn't on WrestleMania. It was on the. Uh, it was on a Raw prior. At the oh, okay. Eagle. Okay. Um, and they did a fireball gimmick where Kane went to shoot a fireball out of his hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that was after we got it reloaded in Gorilla because he set it off. <laughs> well, we have we have established because uh, we, you know a lot of our friends were part of that Batista security force, mm -hmm. and that played on WrestleMania. So therefore, so your it, promo it, probably it probably <laughs> did. Yeah. So yeah, yes, I was on WrestleMania. So then if you go. go that way, there you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he shot the fireball and it hit China. Yeah, you know, and China went down. And the paramedics run to the ring. And it's got to be scary that the wrong crowd is your uh, paramedic for that evening. <laughs> exactly. You're like, oh, I think we're in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The ones your mother warned you about. It. That's it. it what's the, the the advent of that gimmick is actually kind of funny. Um, the name actually came from a book. Mm -hmm. um, Brian Bosworth, the Boz. He did his. He had a book out about his his life at the time. Uh, it was called Confessions of a Modern Day Anti-Hero. Mm -hmm. And he talks about, I believe it was the Orange Bowl, where they um, went up against Penn State. And he talked about how, you know, Penn State, they get off the plane and, you know, they're all in suits and, you know, ties and looking very businesslike. And here's the guys from Oklahoma and cut off camo shorts and muscle tanks. And he said, you know, we were the wrong crowd, the the ones your mother warned you about. And we were like, that's it right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, if the wrong crowd's saving you, there's there's a problem there. <laughs> so <laughs> That's great. So let's talk a little bit more about the tag team. Um, you guys were pretty much an established tag team mm -hmm. much through the mid-90s on through, right? Yeah, well, uh, Brian and I were a tag team throughout most of our careers leading up to PWX. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of, st we stayed the tag team. It was kind of an off and on thing. Um, then we had uh, one of the guys we trained, his name was Jimmy Angel. Mm -hmm. And we brought him in to work with us. It kind of kind of fell into our laps, so to speak, because we were going through a period of time on TV where... Um, the booking was like, I'm not sure if they knew what we were going to do or how we were going to do things. So it was like, kind of like, okay, well, first, first you guys are going to be with each, you know, you and Brian are going to be with each other. Uh, well, now maybe you won't be with each other. And then, you know, Jimmy's the, Jimmy's your student, Paul, and you guys are going to like, kind of have. Is, is Jimmy this third one that I'm seeing in this match? Yeah, he's, okay. he, he's in the white trunks. Okay. And I think we have a, up here, if you guys are with us on video. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it's, he kind of, I mean, he kind of fit in with us, you know, the look, um, it was actually, you know, everybody thought he was a legitimate brother of one of us, mm -hmm. you know, um, cause it was kind of funny when his mom died, we were at the funeral and, and I guess some, somebody came up behind me and said, you know, I'm really sorry for your loss. I'm like, oh, I'm not Jimmy, sorry, <laughs> but thank you anyway. Uh, 
So one night they decided to put the three of us together Mm -hmm. and kind of a little bit of frustration of, you know, they're not really doing much with us. So he said, you know what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out dressed alike and we're just going to pop off and be us, Mm -hmm. you know, and we did that and the crowd bit on it, hook, line and sinker. So then we just evolved, evolved it from there. You know, we had the, um, jean jackets and cut off jean shorts with the airbrush on it you know and we would come out and we would do very very hot in the 90s by the way yes yes it was yeah yeah it was all custom done you know so to speak yeah you just went to the mall and found the airbrush guy yeah yeah but it was custom gear so that's what you need in this business custom gear (laughs) and we would do different kinds of entrances um you know Maybe Jimmy would come from the actual entrance way and we'd come from the back of the store kind of thing. We did a thing, um, one of the first um, outside of radio endeavors that Bubba the Bulldog had, uh, he had like a nightclub type thing and we held a show there and we found a service elevator that went right up to the area where we were at and we come up in the service elevator and we would come out. So this is, you know, uh, we have a lot of conversations with the Rev Ron Hunt about his entrances. <laughs> he always has these in, these uh, innovative entrances that he tries to figure out. Uh, but you guys were doing that back then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were doing that back then. And we would do this, you know, weird, you know, we'd almost like a, you know, striptease type thing with our shorts and our, mm. you know, and our jackets. And it just, it would it would piss off the crowd royally. <laughs> so and there used to be a, a group that would sit in the, if you were looking from uh, from the video, that hard cam that came from the entranceway, mm-hmm. I believe they were off to the left-hand side of the ring. And a few of the guys actually got into the business. Scotty Gash was one of them. They would actually, and again, this isn't, you know, this is before the advent of the internet and things were so readily available. They would literally take and go by poster board. And go out and get magazines and find pictures of male models and cut them out and post them to us and, you know, make fun of our sexuality. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was it, the 90s. Yes. And it's like when you can have that kind of control over a crowd with your gimmick, mm-hmm. it's astounding. I mean, they would do this every single time. You know, they, we we actually started making them part of the act, so to speak, <laughs> because it's like, hey, you want to be part of the show? So be it, man. Yeah. You know, so it, it just it went on from there. And, and then again, everything runs its course. So it had to run its course. Jimmy, Jimmy decided to leave the business. He was actually the oldest of us at the time. He was in his 40s. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he decided that, you know, I, I, I've done it. I'm good. I'm, I'm off, you know. Um we just all suddenly, you know, we all went off and started doing our own thing after that at that point in time. So you know, it's like everything else, it runs, of course. But but for the time we had it, and it, it was probably from late 97 till about mid-99 was our really our first run as the wrong crowd. And it was, I wouldn't trade that time for anything. It was great. So, you know, over that time, of course, you as you're saying, you're, you're getting people's attention. Uh, you're pushing buttons with the crowd. Oh. Are there any incident incidents instances that uh, uh, things got pretty crazy? Uh, you got maybe too much of a reaction out of anybody out there. Uh, it stayed pretty calm for the most part. I mean, there was nothing where you know we didn't have to fight off any marks or any fans or anything like that. <laughs> but um, we could pretty much incite a crowd very easily, you know. And I think. People enjoyed that at the time, you know, because like I said, too, you know, if they were there enough, like these guys that used to sit in the corner, we kind of made them part of the act. Mm-hmm. So they just kind of like, OK, it, we're, one thing that got kind of a little crazy with that group and Scotty would, would tell me this years later, we always used to do a thing where um, if the crowd was getting on us enough, we would just walk out. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to the back. We don't need this. Screw it. Mm-hmm. You know, and then of course the ref would do the 10 count. We'd come out back out before the 10 count. And the group used to try to legitimately make us not come back. They thought they could get under our, they wanted to get under our skin so bad that we literally walked out. Yeah. And every time they thought they did it, we're standing behind the curtain and we're laughing our asses off because we knew what they were doing, mm-hmm. you know, 
And then we'd come back on a son of a bitch. <laughs> and they'd try to get more and more intense with, you know. Um, I don't know that they crossed any lines, but it, yeah, it, it got pretty. If you didn't have a thick skin, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, they got pretty pretty out there with it sometimes in trying to make us just walk off stage, so to speak, mm-hmm. you know, and, and we knew that was part of the performance and we just, we sucked them in with it every time. Uh, Matt Tress was in the chat room and uh, he, he wants me to ask you about the Epic sideshow pizza promo. <laughs> Tell me about the side. Oh, is this online yeah. anywhere? Is this floating around? It was shown on PWX TV, I believe. I'm sure I have it in the archive. Somewhere yes. Then. This <laughs> This is the kind of heat we used to get back then. And sometimes I look back and I think, wow, man, I really probably did some shit that I shouldn't have done. Um, SCW, Steel City Wrestling. Um, Norm had been working with PWX for a while. Um, and the way that kind of came about is Lou Marconi, who is a wrestler out of the Ohio area, uh, was a friend of mine. I'd been on some shows with him. And we had had some people who had left uh, PWX at the time and we needed some bodies. So I called Lou and he had a partner. His name was Frank Stiletto. And I asked them if they would come in and do some PWX shows. And Lou was like, yeah, sure. But I just want to clear it with Norm because you're in the Pittsburgh area. Like, yeah, no problem. So that's how Norm started to work with PWX. Mm -hmm. Actually took over the booking for a while and him and Jim had a falling out. And he went back off to do Steel City Wrestling. And they used to do it at a play. I believe it's in Irwin with Sideshow Pizza. And we got this great idea that we were going to go to Sideshow Pizza and film a promo. Basically making fun of the venue and subsequently the wrestling. And we were in there and we were playing the games and all this. And we actually got one of the workers to admit that the wrestling was pretty crappy <laughs> on the promo. <laughs> it was like, and we played it on, I, I believe we played it on the television show. So that was, yes, that wow. was the infamous um, site. It was, it was, um, it wasn't really an invasion as much more as it was a, we're going to make as much fun of you as we can. <laughs> uh, referee Bobby Williams had it on tape. <laughs> I, you know, I now if somebody can tell me what episode that is, I, I feel like I might have seen something like that while I was scanning yeah. through the tapes. Because we had, um, it was Brian, Jimmy, and myself, <clears throat> and JB Destiny was actually doing the camera work, but we kept calling him. Uh, we had the fourth member who was our head of security. It was Big. Mm-hmm. Okay. But we, we, we played off like Big was the guy behind the camera. You know, we parked our car in a handicapped spot. You know, like we're the wrong crowd. We don't care. You know, and we went, like I said, we went through and we were playing games and we were making fun of things. And, and the best part of it, we didn't even plan it. You know, we mm-hmm. talked to one of the workers. He said, yeah, the wrestling's really not that great. He's like, ah, good. <laughs> uh, Matt's saying this is uh, DX going to WCW before their time, before it's time. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah, we were, uh, you know, we're pretty much knocking on the garage door saying, let us in. This spot is reserved for the wrong crowd, says Bobby. <laughs> Oh, that's great. We're going to have to definitely dig that up and see if we can uh, post that somewhere here. Um, so, uh, and I should mention some of these clips. So, you see, we, so we're digging through some of the archives. Obviously, uh, PWX, a lot of the old stuff is part of the Pro Wrestling Network that we've been working with lately. And and that's where some of these matches have been coming from that we've been putting on the PWX mm-hmm. Media YouTube, uh, on the PBX, PWX Network uh, uh, Facebook page. Again, just kind of resurfacing because nobody's seen this stuff for so long. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's like, you know, everybody talks about the history of Pittsburgh wrestling, but nobody gets a chance to see it yep. unless you're uh, Bobby Williams with his tape out there. <laughs> <laughs> his VHS is yeah. his degrading. VHS. I don't. I don't even think I have my tapes of the programs. Anymore, right, so right. God bless them, man. I mean, so many. You know, or DVDs that don't work from the 2000s and stuff like that. You know, so many guys out there that have their you know careers out there. So it's uh, it's a little bit of a indie wrestling liberation. I think, yeah, to, I mean, to get that I, out there in front of people. I guess, like I said before, I know everything has to evolve, but you should shouldn't forget the past either. No, I mean. No. There were so many guys that that laid the groundwork for what we've got going on here today. Uh, speaking of evolution, let's let's jump ahead a little bit. You know, you're still involved. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you are a, an authority figure with uh, Fight Society, yes. which is kind of the evolution of what P- PWX is. Mm-hmm. 
Um, talk to me a little about that. And also, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, your your shift in the commentary as well. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, well, in 2015, um, I've always I've had knee problems for a while. Yeah. Uh, obviously, from the business. I mean, I've been I've been an athlete since I was seven years old. So, you know, I was developing some severe arthritis in my left knee, and it got to the point where uh, my orthopedist told me he couldn't really do anything about it. Uh, the only thing left to do was to do a knee, total knee replacement, mm -hmm. and, which he didn't do, but he gave me the, a name of another good, you know, very good surgeon. He, he was actually called the guy who fixes others' mistakes. So I went in, and just after my 50th birthday, I had my knee replaced. Well, now I'm done. I can't necessarily work anymore. That's obvious. Uh, so I was out of the business probably for close to a year, and I got a message on social media on Facebook from classic Chris Helmsley that he had pitched an idea to Quinn Magnum um, about a mentor type thing, and he wanted he wanted me to do it, mm -hmm. and would I be interested? So of course you know old school Paul Atlas. The first thing I did was me message Quinn. Do you know anything about this? <laughs> you know. Because sometimes people just come up with these ideas and they just want to do them. He's like, yeah, yeah, we talked a bit about it. Um, I said, so you're on board? He said, well, yeah, uh, we'd love to have you back. So I said, okay, so I'll, I'll do it. You know, so I came back and I was doing that for a little while. And then we, you know, I was helping out in the back, you know, helping out with the, with the booking end and helping out with, uh, you know, getting the shows together and things like that. And we were sitting around and we're kind of thinking, you know, again, things got to evolve, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, PWX has been around for so long and it's like, what can we do to do things differently, you know, to kind of, you know, and we were getting a lot of heat because of the building and where it's located and things like that. So Quinn came up with the idea of let's embrace it rather than fight it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in a crappy part of town and a rundown building mm -hmm. let's be this underground fight club for lack of a better term mm -hmm. it's like yeah that'll i think that'll work you know so we actually did this big thing on the last show of i believe it was of that year uh 2016 i want to say that you know we pretty much did the last match and all the champions came out and laid their belts in the center of the ring. And then myself, Crusher Hansen and Ron, Ron the Beast Williams came out. And in the entrance way, there used to be the PWX. Mm -hmm. And we each grabbed a letter off the wall and we put it in that pile and basically said, right now PWX is gone and dead. And we're going to come back as this fight society. Mm -hmm. So we needed... Of course, some authority figures, you know, everybody knows Quinn is the head guy at PWX. So Ron at the time was going to be uh, like the commissioner. And then we needed like a director. I said, OK, well, you can do that. Yeah, I'll do that because, I mean, my limitations in the ring are very. Is it director of chaos, I believe? He, he is, I am the fight director. You're the fight director. And. It was the Commissioner of Chaos. Commissioner of Chaos. Yes. So that, those were the titles, you know, and we were, I, I think Quinn came up with those two roles for one, one big reason is he hates going out there anymore. <laughs> so it was like, you guys get to go out and do all the setup promos because <laughs> I don't want to do it. <laughs> all right, we'll do it. I mean, I've, I may not be able to do much physically, but I can still talk, damn it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of how that all came about you know, in the evolution of fight society. And of course, unfortunately we lost Ron and then Dean had stepped into that commissioner role. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the fight society came about. Um, which, uh, did not end your time in the ring. Uh, it seems <laughs> as, um, I have a clip online, uh, on the, on the fight society, uh, social media, uh, of the, uh, bloodiest <laughs> match <laughs> And we can say this fight society history because yes. it's not, it's only a couple year history right now. <laughs> uh, you and, 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 and Chris, uh, uh, Helmsley here, um, which 
man, this is <laughs> listen. I I I am not a fan these days of death matches, and you know for for these reasons. But that this is this was like I I'm editing this thing, and I, Missy, my wife was sitting here, and I'm just like, it's still going, it's still coming out, it's dripping, it's this is this is crazy. <laughs> So um, not for the faint of heart if you guys are on video with us right now. What happened? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> to be honest with you. I believe me, that was I, not planned. Was those, okay, so so there was like a moment in the match. You hit him in the head with a, uh, a lens, yes. like a camera lens, yes. right? And it, it looked like a pretty standard hit. And he just... I Yeah, I don't know how the hell... Um, the backstory behind it was Chris had started to um, push back against authority, yeah, so to speak, feeling he was um, being taken advantage of by management, you know. And we came up with the PWX Contenders title, which would be kind of—I um, don't want to say money in a bank, but uh, would guarantee the owner. A one-time I, shot at the head. I, I think it kind of like the gift of the gods on Lucha Underground, like that yeah, kind of something title like that, that yeah. leads to the Because you had title, to you, yeah. you had to be awarded a badge to get into yeah, the match, yeah, you know, and things like that. And the night he won that title, Dean and I, as the authority figures, so to speak, and Quinn don't want to go out there anymore. <laughs> we go out and we present him with the belt, and he attacks me, and Dean comes down and he gets one up on Dean. Um, so we were going to say, you know, say, okay, where can we go with this? I said, well, maybe we may, maybe we can do a match of some sort. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just prior, just after that, my right knee started giving me trouble. So I went in and, uh, they had to do it. They were going to have to do a scope on it. So, uh, that's where we came up with, uh, you know, he attacks the leg, obviously now I got to have surgery, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I love the fact that it fell on Ron's memorial show. I really do because I think it made it special. Um, but we did a promo prior to that where the PWX photographer, Curtis Stevenson, he is my legit best friend in real life. And he was also my manager for a while in the 2000s. Um, Chris wanted promo shots. Come on in, let's do my promo shots. And he attacks Curtis, breaks his camera, leaves him laying. So, you know, he's trying to make this as personal as possible. You know, which, you know, the crowd's like, oh, man, you screwed up now, dude. You know, you, you went after his best friend, you're done. So we had an old camera lens to say this is his camera lens, you know, that, that was broken. And we did the, you know, Curtis comes down from the front. I come down from the back and attack him from behind. Yeah. Pick up the camera lens and I go, and I hit him with it. I did not hit him that hard. But for some reason, it must have caught legit a spot on his head. I don't know if he's got a soft spot on his head or what. <laughs> but you know, maybe his brain's not, or his skull's not fully developed. I don't he's know. He's like a little baby. Then. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it hasn't fully developed yet. And it was gushing before he hit the mat. Mm -hmm. And when he stood up, I was, the first thing I thought of was, shit, I killed him. <laughs> and, well, at least it's going to look good. Yeah. You know? yeah, apparently a little too good. And it, uh, yeah, it wouldn't <laughs> stop. But I, and the sad part is, 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 is messed up and is, you know, people, oh my God, that's gross. And this, I think it added to the match, mm -hmm. to believe it or not. I mm -hmm. mean, it added to that, like this is a real battle between these yeah. two guys, you know, and it does, and we don't get that, you know, for obvious reasons, whether it be you know commission and 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 just safety, and, you know, knowing more now. Uh, but I mean that it did happen more or less accidentally. Yeah, you know, it was it was one hundred percent. It was not planned in any way, shape, or especially to that degree. Yeah, you know. So, uh, yeah, yeah, my producer Missy's coming over. Do you have a uh, something to add here? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Go, go over to that mic over there. Just at least, at least pop on there. So she's got some background on this. Yeah, Missy was there doing the. Was you, you should that be night. live. You should be live. Yes. So I was in the locker room after this match, <laughs> and Paul walks in and he's covered in blood. Like, absolutely covered in blood. So everybody's like, "Dude, are you okay?" And your response was the best. Because he looks, he's like, "Oh, this 
none, none of this is mine. Like this, 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 none of this is mine. <laughs> That's legit. That was it too. It was like, it, serious as a heart attack. Not mine. <laughs> Not mine. Oh, geez. He was like, it's, it's like you should see the other guy. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, of course, that's over on uh, uh, Fight Society. If you want to go, uh, the first episode of Beast Pro uh, show. It wears clips on there if you, you still have the stomach for it. Um, but uh, So when you're not mauling people in McKeesport... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about getting into commentary. You know, you're you're uh, teamed up with Jim Lamada yes. yeah. with uh, Rise with a Y. Uh, I believe you're also with the Uprise as well. Mm-hmm. You've been to, um, and and uh, more recently, uh, the first ever Angel Gate Eye pay per view. Yes, yes. So. And I'm going to be continuing to do color for Angel Gate. Excellent. Moving forward, um, I had done some commentary back uh, with the PWX TV. Uh, we had gotten to a point. Uh, with the wrong crowd where, you know, we were the tag champs for so long and, you know, uh, we, we've run all the competition off and this and that. And the NWA was, we were working more and more with them. And, you know, our goal was to become the NWA champion. So we have no competition here. And until we get our shot, we're just going to go sit at the commentary table. So we, you can catch some of, uh, some of that commentary on the old TV. And, uh, I guess one night at rise, uh, for some reason, the only commentator they had was Jim mm-hmm. and Brandon, uh, who was, uh, Brandon K, you know, Rise's owner, who I trained in, in the business. He was like, Hey, you used to do commentary, didn't you? I said, yeah, I used to do it. He said, would you like to sit in tonight? Sure. Why not? I'll sit in, you know, and Jim and I just kind of clicked. Mm-hmm. It was, I mean, Jim is great to work with. I mean, he knows, he knows the business he knows the wrestling uh he knows um, the history and he can he can throw up you know the softballs for me to hit them out of the park and we just clicked so well on it i was like after you know after brandon had heard the the, the program back he's like that was astounding he's like would you work with jim all the time i said, sure i'll work with jim all the time it was, it was great it was fun mm-hmm. you know so we just kind of progressed from there so and then um they started with the Uprise shows, mm-hmm. so we moved over there, and then kind of Uprise is the kind of the the um, uh, I think an NXT for for Rise. Yes, you know, yeah, a lot, a lot of newer talent getting opportunities. Yeah, it gives it gives the younger guys an opportunity to uh, get out there and work in front of a crowd, you know, um, and just just you know feel themselves into the business, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah, the same same thing kind of happened with Angel Gate, the last show where. You know, they needed a commentator, a second guy. And, um, of course, we were live mm-hmm. that night. So it's like, well, we got to do something that, you know, I mean, there's no fixing anything in post tonight, guys. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, you know, Jim had said, you know, hey, Paul and I work so well together. Why don't we just do this? Yeah. yeah. So we, you know, we sat down and we did the show together. And, yeah, and, and Jim mean? actually made the comment afterwards. He goes, you didn't know a single person in that ring that night. I said, no, I'm really not familiar with a lot of these girls. Yeah, yeah. And he heard, you know, he listened back to the broadcast. He's like, it sounded like we knew everything about every one of them. It's like, well, that's kind of what we wanted. <laughs> had you ever done a live Never. commentary like that? Never before? done a live. That was the, my first time doing a live, as it happened, commentary. Wow. So. Uh, you can check that out. The last couple of episodes of Angel Gate. Uh, as well. Hey, it's uh, we're we're head up on an hour here, and uh, I I want to. It's a lot of great comments in the chat room, by the way. Lo- love coming at you from Ron Hunt, from <laughs> Brandon K. Uh, thanks for making me a wrestler. I became. Uh, thanks for making me the wrestler. I became my mentor. Uh, a lot of other guys giving love out there. If you want to check out and the chat, I tell you what, a lot of a lot of it back to us. But I mean, Brandon and Quinn, especially. You know, I mean. Out of all the people I trained, I believe they're the only two left in the business at this time. Mm-hmm. And look at what they're doing. Each one basically runs their own company, and I couldn't be prouder of both of them. Fantastic. So, so uh, i like to end off on uh, a little bit of a bigger question. What is the best and the worst of uh, professional wrestling for you? Or what was, yeah, what's the good and the bad of the good professional and the, the good wrestling? and the bad. Um, the good is, I mean, I've had, I've gotten to do a lot of things that a guy who's just north of 53 years old could never say they've done as a result of professional wrestling. And 
believe it or not, probably the worst is I'm still sitting here at 53 years old <laughs> involved in this stuff because once you get in, you never get out. You know, even my family's like, what are you doing? Why are you still doing this? <laughs> Especially when it came down to doing this last semester. Like, are you insane? Why are you even out there? So it, yeah, it's a disease. That's all I can say. To all you young guys, it's a disease and you're never getting out. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to it. Well, hey, thank you so much. It's great to get to know you here over the last year or so and the last hour. Uh, so, <laughs> And it's been fantastic working with you guys. Uh, and I hope this relationship continues for a long time. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, great stuff going on there. Again, you can hear uh, Paul's voice over on Rise with a Y uh, and Uprise, as well as the Angel Gate shows between uh, IndieWrestling.us and the Pro Wrestling Network at PWNNetwork.com uh, with Fight Society. Uh, of course, sometimes in ring uh, and involved, and sometimes just making chaos happen. Uh, uh, online, where can people um, find you? Uh, I do have a Facebook page, Paul Atlas. Uh, mm-hmm. I am on Twitter at Paul Atlas, and I also have Instagram, Paul Atlas. So there you, you can find me on social media pretty much on all three venues. Go catch up with him. Thank you so much. And of course, please check out everything going on WrestlingMamShow.com, IndieWrestling.us for past episodes like this. And again, a lot of people we talk with, like Paul. Uh, featured on a lot of those sites uh, a lot of those shows are on there as well uh, thank you and until next time please support DB Wrestling this show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network find out more at sorgatronmedia.com